honey drips off like flower do. Sure, I know that your son has a... American, American down there. Um, <laughs> probably took six or seven years before people just started to call me Kate instead of the American. So the whole time they were just calling you Kate. I mean, the American. The American. I mean, not to my face, but <laughs> right. on the street. <laughs> yeah. um, passing my UK driving test, that took four goes. That was probably not one of my better moments. <laughs> I don't ever say the word bloody because when I say things are, when I say bloody hell, it sounds like there's actually blood on them. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you think you're bringing a baby home and instead you're having to go home and think about planning a funeral because in the UK, if your loss is beyond 24 weeks, it, a funeral is a requirement, even if you don't go. So, you know, that's, there's quite a few things which are very, I thought I'd be doing this and instead I'm doing this. Instead I'm trying to ring around funeral directors and find out, you know, where we want to have our daughter's funeral. Hi, I'm Effie Barker. We are right here in downtown. When you say we're not going away with these issues, what are those issues? Today's episode, I will be talking to an American immigrant who is originally from Texas. She used to organize events for the MBA program when she was still in the States. She initially moved here in the UK to Yorkshire in 2005 with her former spouse and later got divorced in 2013. And now she still lives with her, uh, she still lives in Yorkshire with now her current husband. Let's welcome Kate Bryn. Hello, Kate. Welcome, welcome to the show. I'm so glad we made it. And finally, the rain has stopped in my area, but I don't know in your area. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for squeezing it. It's sunny here as well. Yes. Right. <laughs> so again, thank you for squeezing us into your busy schedule. I know you are very busy. Yes. No, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. And so let's start off. So you are from Texas, or they say Texas. <laughs> you moved here in 2005. An initial uh, talk I had with you earlier, you mentioned that you met your former spouse in uh on a holiday yes. in France. Yes. Tell us yes. about that. Uh, tell us about your move. Why are you here in the UK? Uh, well, probably because of September 11th, because I was living in New York at the time. Um, and I had already met Paul, my first husband. Um, and we were kind of doing the transatlantic romance. Um, and then September 11th happened. And uh, prior to that time, he was thinking about moving to New York to be with me. And that just seemed like a really bad idea. Um, so I quit my job and moved to France to be together because I think everyone who lived in New York at that time kind of, you realized that the time that you thought to do the things that you had on your wish list uh, was actually, it might not be as long as you think. So whatever, you know, whatever you wanted to do, like to just make those plans and do it. Um, so yeah, I moved to France with no job and uh, for love, uh, which so that to the answer the million dollar question for love. <laughs> Wait, wait, he was uh, British, isn't he? He was British, yes. He is British, yes. He is, yeah. <laughs> um, and so we lived um, in France, and you know, eventually we kind of we got married in France uh, in 2003, and uh, I got I, I got work there, and we stayed for another couple of years in France before we decided that the kind of French adventure was at an end. And so, where did we want to move to? Um, so we visited uh, some of his family in London and in Yorkshire. And um, because I went to university in New York and we had spent part of our time together in Paris, well, the first time I went to London, I just was like, don't think I want to be a new person in another big city. Um, so we, we came to Leeds and uh, I really liked the feel of it. Um, and I remember going for a meal, Thai food, uh, which, French people, which French people don't do very well. There's lots of great food in France, but Thai food is not one of the cuisines that they excel at. Uh, and we had a really nice Thai meal, and I sat back and I thought, oh, yeah, I think I can move to Leeds. Okay. <laughs> so that was Leeds. so that's how we made the decision. Um, and then we started sorting out some things with work and um, handing in our notice and all of that. Um, and then we arrived. I think it was January two thousand and five. So yeah. Okay. So how was it uh, with the immigration process as an American moving to <laughs> France with the British? Well, there, there was an EU still at that time, was it? It was in the EU still, um, and I had 
uh, some kind of visa at first, and then it became much easier once we got married. I remember thinking that that was a factor that kind of pushed us to get married um, in Fr and to get married in France. That also made things a little bit easier. Um, and then by the time we moved to the UK, I had been married two years already. Uh, so the indefinite leave to remain process was was pretty straightforward at that time because we had been already married in a, in a previous in a country. And I had um, some documentation from the consulate, the French consulate, the British consulate in France. Um, so I did. So that that was that was fairly straightforward. I mean, I say fairly straightforward, but. I mean, there were, um, there were still dramas, but it was nearly 20 years ago now. So luckily, right. <laughs> they don't feel quite as intense as right. they did probably at the time. <laughs> yeah, but um, um, uh, it wasn't a fiancé visa, if you recall. What was it? The, the, the one that you had? It wasn't a fiancé visa. No, because I was already married. It was it was ILR, definitely. For oh, marriage. you got married. And in, then two years right. in France. And so then by the time I arrived here, then I had a two-year process. Um the, the pre-stage of the I, of the indefinite leave to remain and then I got my IR, ILR like two years after we well, that was arrived. quick then so, so you only had two years say in the UK and you got your ILR mm, lucky yeah. you yeah it was back then <laughs> no it's <Yes>. five years <laughs> but yeah so take us um, a, let's let's do fast forward so you you were here sure. in the UK from 2005 is that right yes Bought a house, bought a house in Yorkshire in 2006. Um, and this is the house I've stayed in where, where you know, you're right, okay. where I'm speaking from. Right. Um, and so, yeah, buying property, that's a fun thing in the UK. That's, that's Did you get to weird. get a job easily? Did you get to work right away? I, I did. So I did. I did job hunt from France in Leeds, and that was really difficult. And I did have someone in recruitment say to me, like, look, you know, you've got lots of uh, I was also organizing events in France. So yes, so she told me that this person in recruitment told me, you know, you're a great candidate, but there's always going to be for a, for a job based in Leeds. You know, there's someone in Scunthorpe, there's someone in Wakefield, there's someone in Doncaster, who is going to get the job before you because it's just too weird trying to drop job hunt in your in Yorkshire from France. Um, so she said, when you have actually arrived, let me know, um, and I'll I'll help you. And actually, true to her word, um, when I did land. You know, six months later, when we did actually move to Yorkshire, um, I went on quite a few job interviews with her. I got uh, th three different processes. I had two job offers, and so I actually had two things to choose from. And my experience in France, I worked for the same company that my husband did, um, and that had pros and cons. You know, we didn't have a very big social circle in France because we worked for the same people, and most of our friends were from work, and it was. That was it was just a too small of a pool. So the job that I chose that I went with in the end was one that would expose me to more people, more different groups of people. So that's definitely something I learned from France moving to the UK. Um, and then, yeah, the, another thing I learned is to just um, grow those social networks, find other people mm -hmm. who have more interest to you. And that is how to make friends. In right. The UK. But how was your interaction when you initially moved here in the UK? I was probably well. Um, I know when we bought our house on on our streets, uh, they the other our, our neighbors, apart from one, um, were sort of like, "Oh yeah, that house the American bought at the end." <laughs> you could you could sort of hear overhear people on the street saying, "Oh yeah, you know American American down there." Um, and now there's actually quite a few. It's her, my next door neighbor, uh, her husband is Canadian. There's another Canadian family. There's another American on the street. So I was kind of the first one, mm. um, but it probably took six or seven years before people just started to call me Kate instead of the American. So the whole time yeah. they were just calling you Kate. I mean, the American. The American. I mean, not to my face, <laughs> but <laughs> <Right>. on the street. <laughs> yeah, to each other. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, there's, you, I think if you live in England and you live in a, I mean, I don't live in a village, really. It's a suburb of Bradford where I live. Um, you do have to kind of make your peace with being the only American in the village. I am lucky that I am not the only American, mm. but you know, you do stand out in a different way. And so you have to kind of make your own peace with that. You know, you, you get, you get asked a lot. The question that you asked, how did you end up here? Well, how does a Texan want to live in Bradford? Like with the weather, surely you'd want to stay in Texas. You know, that question you get asked a lot. Um, so you just kind of have to work out what it is, how are you going to respond to that? 
Um, and so normally I say the short answer is love because that's also the reason why I've stayed here. When I separated from my ex-husband and got divorced and then thought about what to do next, do I move back home to Texas? Um, is that home? Does that feel like home anymore? Um, could I really cope with living alongside so many people who have different political views to me? I mean, I'm a much more of a socialist than probably you know, 95% of the people who live in Texas. Um, I see social ills around the environment. You know, sometimes now I go back to Texas and I just look at the number of massive gigantic vehicles and the huge highways and I'm like, there's, there's, there's something wrong with this. This mm. is shocking. This should shock everyone who lives here, mm. but it doesn't, it's normal. So um, yeah, so I think- shocked you cool. here in the UK? Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, at some stage did my UK driving license. And so now I drive here on the other side of the road. So when I go to home to Texas to see my family, I try not to drive because I just kind of want to keep myself on the left hand side of the of the car. Because yeah. <laughs> it took a long time to unlearn all of that, mm -hmm. um, driving on the left hand side or the right hand side. How was your adjustment then? Um... Was it some some people really have a tough time adjusting here with and some of them were shocked with the culture. Were you at all shocked with what you've seen? Or did you have but before that, did you have any expectation at all what your life would be when you get here? And did it happen? Um I so I think I'm lucky in two respects. One is that I did have a couple of years in France to kind of acclimatize myself to living in Europe. And I know that Brits would be I mean, we aren't part of Europe, but there, I mean, that also, that was one thing that shocked me, even with my ex-husband, like his view of, um, you know, our, our England is the UK connected to Europe. And I'm, he was like, no, no, we're not. We're our own separate island. I'm like, yeah, but you're still on the continent of Europe, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's definitely some views there, which are different than what I expected. But I had time in France to kind of acclimatize. And then because we had visited London and we had visited Leeds, I felt like I knew what I was getting myself in for when we moved here. Um, I kind of knew what to expect. Uh, so my expectations were more aligned with what the reality is. Here, mm -hmm. I think. Okay, that's great. Okay. Is it, would you say, is it an advantage of being in America and living here in the UK or any of these, what are those advantages and what are disadvantages? Um, I think there, there definitely are advantages. Um, in my job in particular, uh, there's there's advantages around being American, having that American accent, mm -hmm. um, and being able to step outside of some social conventions. Right? I, I never am worried about class. Uh, it never. I never find myself thinking, "Oh, I can't ask that person that question because of, you know, whatever." Because I come from a working class background in the in the northwest of England or something. I never find myself asking those questions. Um, so I think from some aspects that is a benefit to be American because you can kind of reinvent yourself and you can you can decide what sort of because you know Brits they all have seen America on TV and many of them have traveled in the states but they don't they've never lived there so there's a lot of you know a lot of my colleagues know that my dad was in the oil industry that he was a geologist so um, I'm sure that they I'm sure they think right you know Kate comes from some kind of oil money it, that's not really the case but I'll just leave them with that assumption. <laughs> That's fine. Nobody's okay. nobody's asked me more questions about what exactly my dad does, but Kate's obviously from Texas because her dad's in oil business. Mm. It's sort of, you know, assumption that gets made. Um, I think, you know, the environment is important to me. I think Brits are much more, you know, we're no, we're no longer having the debate about what, whether or not climate change exists or doesn't exist. It clearly exists. We, we feel that in every single season in, in England. The length of time that I've lived here, the climate has definitely changed. Uh, and, you know, it saddens me that in parts of America, people are still grappling with that and still arguing about whether or not climate change exists and whether or not humans can have an impact on the environment. Of course, they can and they have and they are. And until America and you know, some of the other economies accept that, then it feels like, you know, we're not going to make much progress with that, which I think is a shame. Right. Was there any challenges at all that you've experienced or the very or the toughest experience that you've had? Um, passing my UK driving test, that took four goes. That was probably not one of my better moments. Um, four times. Yeah. Uh, I also... Don't worry, we're the same. I got it in a fourth try. <laughs> um, I think also the experience that my husband have had and I have had having children 
um, as I you know mentioned in my mm. kind of in just disc- pre pre interview discussions with you. Mm. Um, our first child was stillborn. Um, she we knew before she was born that her heart had stopped, and so that's that's a very I mean I think in any any time that you lose a child or a baby, um, it affects you and it changes you. But there definitely was an extra element there for us that my husband is from Northern Ireland. So he's far away from his family, even though, mm-hmm. you know, they're a flight away from us, but I'm further away from my family. But in those kinds of circumstances, it doesn't really matter. You know, your family's far, having to deal with something really difficult. It's also difficult for your parents or the child's grandparents because they're also, you know, mourning something that they've lost. You feel bad and guilty about the fact that you've caused them this kind of pain, um, even though, you know, your own pain, a parent losing a child is really great. So that's definitely been a challenge. Um, subsequent pregnancies have then been a challenge, very tricky, uh, and navigating all of that in the in the national health system. It, you know, it's a different medical system to the states. I think it's fantastic, um, and we have had very very good care. But I know that that isn't always the case, and I think for immigrants of other backgrounds and whether or not you know thank god english is our first language right i mean i have experience of living i can't imagine trying to explain some of that in another language uh that's just an added layer of difficulty so in some ways you're lucky that if we had to be living in a foreign country that at least it was one where we both spoke the language and um could advocate for ourselves and about what it is that we wanted and needed at the time because you know you definitely need things you need support you need help uh and it's not always and if your families are far away they can't always be the ones to provide that so you have to get good at asking for what you need and demanding that you get it and that i think that's that's definitely harder for immigrants i think Um, how did you how did you i'm I'm a mother of four years old and i i I don't know. I keep thinking sometimes I've got, we've got all our worries sometimes, especially if I, I don't see her. I feel like I wanted to see her like 24 seven. And mm-hmm. um, so how did you cope at the time when the stillborn, like you were away? Uh, I mean, you get through it day by day. There is, there's some good charities in the UK. Um, one of whom, the main charity for stillbirth and neonatal death is called SANS. Uh, and I do fundraising. I, I'm quite active with them. That that helps me. They definitely helped me. Um, at the time, they had, you know, I think they still do have resources online. I remember sending my my parents a book. <laughs> I remember sending my parents one of their like a link to one of their guide, you know, stillbirth for grandparents guide, um, because I just knew that they weren't going to know what to say or do, and I couldn't really put it into words. They had other guides like. You know, you're, you think you're bringing a baby home and instead you're having to go home and think about planning a funeral. Because in the UK, if your loss is beyond 24 weeks, it, a funeral is a requirement, even if you don't go. So, you know, that's there's quite a few things which are very, I thought I'd be doing this and instead I'm doing this. Instead, I'm trying to ring around funeral directors and find out, you know, where we want to have our daughter's funeral. Uh, and then big decisions to make. Where do you bury them? Do you bury them? Do you have them cremated? Um, Which is the option that we went because it just felt weird to put a piece of us in the ground in England, even Mm -hmm. though it's the place that we where we decided to live, both my husband and I. I don't know. That kind of made me feel like I could never leave if I did that. Mm -hmm. Um, So we yeah we had her cremated and we've scattered her ashes in a place that is special to us. And we try and go there for her birthday every year. All right. And we have some, we have some rituals and routines that helps us cope. That very much I think probably helped us cope in the first um, oh. year. Uh, and then in 2018, our first son was born, uh, Bruce. He's called, and he's almost six. Uh, and then in 2022, we had another little boy called Roger, who just turned two on Saturday. So. Great. Yeah, that uh, does that having child after the stillborn helped you at all? Because I heard it from my, my mm-hmm. friend as well who lost a child. She told me I, it's slowly kind of they like, don't re- they don't replace the child that you've missed. Of course, yes. You've lost. Um, 
but there is definitely something hormonal about needing to be a parent, even more so after you've had a loss. Some of that is chemical. I think it's called empty arm syndrome. I think I definitely experienced that. Um, but I mean, it's a double-edged sword, sword, right? I the the birth of my second son, Roger, was um, really triggering in a way that I didn't expect. Uh, because when Bruce was when Bruce arrived, we were just so happy to have a live baby. <laughs> just, just say it as it is, bluntly. Like, you know, we had a live baby to take home and to love, and uh, then we kind of realized what we had missed out on. Um, you know, you have your memory box and you have thing, other things that you do and you think you're, you know, try, you're kind of parenting for the child that you've lost in the way that you can. But then you bring the baby home and you're like, oh God, you know, all of these little moments of joy that we've missed out on. Um, and then when Roger came, he was so similar to Bruce in so many ways. It really made me think that that's what Isabel, our daughter, would have been like. Mm. Um, all right. And so you, it kind of, yeah, rips the scab off. Wound like you said, somehow. it's it's a double-edged horn. Yeah. 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 Was there was at the time when it was happening, or even a little bit after that, did it change your decision at all, or you still like the UK, or you want to move away from it because this is what would happen, or was there a time at all in your experience that you didn't want to be here anymore, and like, mm, I. Definitely in the pandemic, it felt further away. I mean, my my parents and my siblings have visited me, visited us, me, quite a few times, but the pandemic made it feel like Texas was really far away. Um, oh. and, you know, and my grandparents really, my, my parents really felt out like they missed out a, you know, a key chunk of time with Bruce mm -hmm. because they didn't get to see him for you know the best part of two years really. Um, and can change so much. Little, you know, young children change so much in that time. Um, when we, when we went, so we both after Bruce and then after Roger, we were lucky enough to spend like a month in Texas with my family. Um, and this last time that we went with Roger, the at the end of the first week, we went out to dinner, my husband and I, and we were like, I, I just said, are we being selfish, right? Our kids enjoy being around their cousins so much. Like, why are we living in a place with um, uh, my we, my brother's sister has kids in Northern Ireland. So, you know, we're living in a place where there's cousins in two locations. We don't live there. Hmm. And is that a bad decision? And uh, Jason said, well, let's just see how we feel at the end of this month. Because when else are we going to have a month to like kind of think about it? And so that's what we kind of decided to do. And at the end of that holiday, we chatted again and we were like, do we think we want to move to Texas? Do we think we want to do that? And both of us were like, unequivocally, we were like, no, no, mm. there's, there's just too many compromises. I don't think that they, you know, American work ethic and the American dream, the American dream. I mean, what a load of bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think there's so many compromises that we would have to make on a quality of family life that we have in the UK as much it would be as it would be nice to be closer to my parents and to my brothers and sisters and their families i think we'd all be having to work so many hours to fund that i don't think that we would get better quality for life right in the main no and and also you know as much as people like to moan about the weather in britain when it's good it's really good and so it makes you live in the moment. And so if it's if a beautiful day, if it's a beautiful day or a beautiful day is forecast tomorrow, like literally drop everything and get outside and enjoy it because you can't plan that it's gonna be good the following day. And that is a source of frustration for a lot of people, uh, but it's it, it does make you live in the moment and appreciate it. And we do get, you know, more like four seasons. Whereas in Texas where I'm from, it's baking hot. It's 40 degrees, over a hundred degrees. From the first of june until the middle of september so you know the summer is not actually that nice because all you're doing is being in air-conditioned spaces all the time so you might as well be in england be in heated spaces in the winter and at least get to enjoy the summer and be outside so right yeah so you don't have any um desire at all of moving back to the states i don't think so i miss the food sometimes right that's uh, what I'm obviously that's an important thing to me in my stomach uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, I can't get the good Tex-Mex food. You know, I can't get freshly made tortilla chips and salsa and salsa anywhere decent. Probably in London I could find it, but not in Yorkshire. Uh, but that's fine. I just learned how to make good te Tex-Mex food and barbecue at home. So um, yeah, you find your way around. Uh, I think in the main, I have enough fr friends and family who will bring me Cheetos, crunchy Cheetos, and post them to me and bring them in their suitcases so I can get my, it's always junk food, right, that you want, that you pay, <laughs> so Cheetos is my thing that I miss. Yeah. Well, aside from the food, what are the other things that you miss in America? Um, I mean, sometimes some of the convenient, you know, there are things about the States that are really convenient. Um, and sometimes you miss that, especially I think the more that you have kids and now that we have two rambunctious boys, uh, there are some elements of, you know, having a laundry room. There's some elements of just life that's more convenient. We live in a terraced Victorian house. We don't have a driveway. So, you know, sometimes some of my friends are like, oh yeah, we pulled up at home and I just let them sleep in the car, you know, for an hour on the driveway. And I was like, well, I can't really do that on the street because I had to park like, you know, way down there. <laughs> I can't see them from the window. <laughs> um, so yeah, there are some minor irritations yeah. like that, but right. I think nothing yeah. is major. Nothing is unsurmountable. Did you know anybody aside from your pre previous husband? Did you know anybody here in the UK before you moved here? No. Okay. No. Were you attracted to the UK before you moved here? Uh, I actually have probably been attracted to the UK my whole life. I just didn't necessarily realize that some of the musicians that I liked were British. I probably assumed they were American, like mm -hmm. George Michael is a perfect example. Uh, you know, he had that video with supermodels in it and an American mm -hmm. flag. So I just assumed he was American. Uh, there's also a lot of books and TV shows. Um, literature that it, you know I do really like literature like it's cool I live just around the you know I live really not far away from Emily Bronte lived her life um in Haworth that's really not far from where I am uh so yeah I would say I was probably an un, I was probably an Anglophile before I knew it um all things great and small creatures great and small those books I those three books I probably read three or four times Ugh. um before when I was when I was a child uh, before I moved to England so yeah there's quite a few things about English culture and English life that attracted me before I lived here yes what are the uh, biggest misconceptions of uh, the UK oh. well it's not all London <laughs> I still have family that ask me so how's London I'm like I don't know it's three hours away from where I live um <laughs> So I just start asking them about, you know, if they live, I've got a lot of family in North Dakota. So if they live, you know, someone like, so how's Fargo? And they're like, I don't live in Fargo. It's like, well, I don't live in London either. Um, <laughs> so that's one misconception. Um, it's, it's really difficult for Americans to understand the, what is the UK? What is Great Britain? Ireland and Northern Ireland, like all of that's very complex. Uh, I've had to explain that to my family my immediate family like numerous times before they kind of like get it and they have made an effort to understand it because it's obviously important to my husband being from northern ireland he has a british passport but he definitely identifies as irish um other misconceptions <sighs> roundabouts really are hard um you know some misconceptions are true brits do really probably drink too much um even though I love pub, pubs and pub culture and real ale, but yeah, uh, it's definitely an unhealthy relationship. But I think it's also true for the uh, you, Brits or the UK misconception of America that it's all like New York or Los Angeles, I guess. Or, but it's like in in its state, it's it's like its own country. Yes, like different culture. Texas, different Texas is actually almost the same size as France. Exactly. <laughs> And when they talk, they say like, oh, in America, uh, maybe you should say in California or in Texas. <laughs> or in New York or in Kentucky or in, yeah, whatever place, you know. Right, yeah. I've lost a lot of my Texan, y'all, mm. uh, on purpose. Uh, but I have also, I get asked if I'm Canadian a lot, 
which I think is a nice way. I mean, some Amer- some Texans would be offended by that. Oh. But I'm just like, it just means I've softened. It means I've softened. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, my American accent isn't going to go. And there are some decisions I've made about what words I will and won't use. Like, it's always, you'll never find me saying, where is that dustbin lorry man? I mean, that's ridiculous. It's a trash man. It's a trash can. <laughs> Like so, trash. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm all about. That's a word I'm keeping. Um, I will compromise on lift and escalator and elevator and you know, flashlight and torch, sidewalk and pavement. Some of those I'll compromise on because you just get, you know, oh, I need to go in the elevator and someone frowns at you like, what the hell is she talking about? It's just easier to say the word lift. But I think it's for every American to make their own mind up about which words they want to. Yeah. You know, I do occasionally say the word lovely. Don't say it a lot because I think it sounds a bit like I don't ever say the word bloody because when I say things are, when I say bloody hell, it sounds like there's actually blood on them. So <laughs> but there's some words and expressions that you just have to try out. And if they work for you, great. And if they don't, then, yeah. then you know, isn't it this silly that we have to think about like, hmm, what level of American am I going to give, right? Yeah. What, what, what American, you know, like, yeah. But you do have to consider it because you have to consider your audience and Correct. you have to flex to your, yeah. When we come back, we will get to know more about our guest, uh, Karen Breeze. Mm-hmm. 